and welcome to Talk Art. I'm Sally Rain, and I will be your host as we delve into the world of the artist and the art that's all around us. Talk Art is sponsored by the Silicon Valley Open Studios. During the first three weekends in May, hundreds of local artists open their studios to the public. For more information, go to the website sbos.org. Our guest for this show is Terry Geyer. And Terry is a realist oil painter who uses alternating layers of opaque and translucent oil on linen background. He specializes in small and large format portraits, seascapes, landscapes, and beautiful action paintings using horses. So welcome, Terry. Thank you, Sally. It's good to be here. Yes, uh, let's start with a little bit about your background. How did you get involved in realistic painting? Well, it's interesting. I um, grew up in the Midwest, and like everyone else, I started drawing when I was five years old and that sort of thing. And uh, um, by the time I was in high school, I started working in an art studio as an assistant and uh, uh, would do paintings in the basement and that sort of thing. And, and uh, um, I got an opportunity to go to the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. At the time, I was doing sort of surrealistic paintings mm -hmm. and uh, some pop art edge to it, and uh, and that's how I got into the, the art school. Uh, and the funny thing is, is they were just little tiny paintings at the time. And uh, <laughs> later on, when we talk about small. how big the paintings are now, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's another contrast. Well, uh, as I went on. Through art school, I was um, uh, allowed to go on the junior year abroad program in the UK. Oh, nice. So you went to England? Yes. And so at that time, they brought me in because I was a surrealist painter, and uh, they didn't do that sort of thing in England, so that would be a good influence on the English students. And, of course, when I got to the UK and started going to the museums and all this incredible um, academic artwork and uh, figurative work, um, I just kind of flopped, you know, it's just like, wow, this is really cool, you know, and, and uh, I started doing all this research on it and, and so you reading became, books. you became a realistic painter yeah, in I that part of your I started education. changing at that point, yeah, and uh, doing a lot of life uh, drawing and um, classes and um, quite contrary to what they brought me over to England for, but it works out. <laughs> So, and then you began your career as an illustrator? Uh, yes. Uh, after going to Europe, I realized I didn't have to live in Minneapolis all my life and that there was places where it wasn't uh, a frozen wasteland all the time during the winter. Uh, so as soon as I, I graduated from art school, um, my number one priority was to go somewhere that I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had uh, milder weather and uh, more of a European environment. Couldn't go back to Europe because uh, just couldn't get work, so uh, I picked out atlases and ended up uh, out on the west coast and um, went back to, I had been working in art studios throughout college and uh, uh, earned, li earned money to, to go to school even though I was a painter in college. Uh, so when I got out to the west coast I started looking for that kind of work again and started by doing graphic design and then eventually worked my way into doing um, primarily illustration work. And from there, I've gotten back into painting, so. Well, excellent, yeah, and you have some beautiful paintings. What type of paintings have you been working on lately? Uh, lately, I've been doing a lot of uh, portraiture, um, and uh, I've been doing a lot of landscapes, and now I'm sort of blending the uh, two together and, and making more complex paintings with humans, animals, and uh, landscape altogether. Well, excellent. And you brought some JPEG images that um, we can show yes. the audience. Yes. yes. So they're beautiful. So portraits as well, examples of some of the portraits that you've done. Yeah. Um, I, used, I used to do uh, just figures without backgrounds. And then uh, uh, out here I started learning about uh, landscape. Ah, there we go. Uh, and I started doing landscapes, uh, first plein air, and then uh, 
and then using plein air sketches and photographs of taking outdoors and to do studio paintings because I really like the finish of a studio painting. So these are some of the lands, a couple of the landscapes uh, done in the studio. I ran around Half Moon Bay and took a lot of pictures for um, reference for areas that I've seen many times. Uh, this was a commission I did in uh, northern Idaho of uh, a client's view from his, his uh, second home in Idaho, about 20 miles from uh, Yellowstone Park. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, so that's, does, does he have it in his other home? <laughs> uh, actually, they had it in there. Um, he gave it to his wife for her birthday, and they put it in there. Uh, she put it in her office in Scottsdale, and uh, they had a glass wall. It was on top of a glass wall. It's just nice. It's uh, two feet Here's by four feet. Here's an example of the portrait. Yeah, the portraiture. Uh, these, uh, this is a, uh, a young boy that was uh, uh, Theo, in, um, very active young man. I, we took I took pictures of him in all kinds of different situations, and uh, he really got lively once we got out <laughs> to the beach. And uh, his folks kind of wanted to, um, because they were going to end up in the East Coast. Well. we'll well, we'll move on for that. Uh, th this is a, a couple's painting. Um, both are 30 by 40 uh, inches and, uh, you know, hang like next to each other. So those are two separate paintings? Yeah. And, uh, and the next one? Yeah, and that's an example of a family shot. Uh, did, a lot of, did a lot of photographs of this family indoors and outdoors. Uh, they wanted a group and they wanted something fun. And then when I got done taking the photographs, uh, they all ran up to the putting green and started playing around. And I thought, oh, why didn't I think of that? So when I went to show them the photographs to make a selection for a direction for the painting, I also did a quick drawing of them up on their putting green like this. And they said, oh, we have to have that. Let's so have that one. Well, I went back and we photographed them in many different poses. And, uh, Do you ever photos. have people sit for you live while you're painting? Uh, well? Yeah, that's well, always preferable. Uh, but um, a lot of people have time constraints, and what I try to do is to, we'll take photographs, of many, many photographs, and I use several sections of different photographs, and then I try to have them come in and for at least one sitting um, after the painting's far advanced and, and add more detail, take some more pictures, and, and uh, work oh, nice. from that. So, yeah, so towards the end, the, they might come in and sit. Yeah, and I'm trying, if I'm, you're lucky. I'm, I'm <laughs> leaning towards trying to make people sit for the whole portrait instead. Oh, that's tough. I did that for my grandmother once. It took a long time <laughs> sitting still. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I can, I, I did some pretty reasonably good uh, portraits in three sittings uh, oh, that's before. Not bad. And uh, they weren't as detailed as most of the portraiture I do, so probably five or six sittings would do it. Oh, that's not and too bad. And it's a lot more um, dynamics to it, working, working live. Right, so. yeah. So you also brought some paintings into the studio. So why don't you talk a little bit about this rodeo piece that you brought in? It's okay. beautiful. Yeah, this is the most recent painting I've done. Um, and like I said, I'm, I'm moving from, uh, I've done the landscape work. And I, I, for me, I want to get a little more complexity into it. I've done a lot of portrait work and um, done a lot of study of animals and, and that sort of thing. So now I'm gravitating towards putting figures into landscapes and adding animals as well for a lot more of a dynamic and um, a complex um, visual image. Some more motion and action? Yeah. Like so I think piece. this is a direction, a similar direction I'm going to be going. I've, did, I've been uh, getting, getting some reference shots of equestrian riders uh, the last few days, and I'm going to do a series of equestrian. Oh, nice, like jumpers or yeah, things jumpers. like that? Yeah, jumpers. Nice. And uh, some of the movement of the horses is they, they even run around the track going to the next jump. They just kind of lean off to the side. It's really incredible. Yeah, horses are beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure the detail is incredibly difficult to paint, though. Yeah, I, I've, I've done a lot of study of an anatomy, and, and what I'll do is I'm in the middle of a painting. As I reach parts where I'm not exactly sure what I'm doing, I just go back down into research and I'll, I'll start go through anatomy books or whatever and do rough sketches and, and, and you know, solve the problem um, and then go back to the painting. 
Oh, so even in the middle of the painting, you're still doing research. Yeah, actually, I kind of look as the painting. What I enjoy about doing a painting is, is it, it is like a research project. You know, you're working. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm working my way through it. As I'm working through it, I'm gaining more and more knowledge, more visual knowledge. I'm, I'm making more complex and interesting uh, color combinations and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's excellent. So you have been involved in an enormous project with the Silicon Valley Luminary Society. Yes. Joint, and those were like many, many portraits on very large canvases. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got involved with that, what it is? Okay, well, I'm, I've been doing portraiture, and um, I usually stretch my own canvases when they're, you know, modest size, like, uh, you know, 30 by 40 or whatever is, is I'm still comfortable stretching. Um, it gets larger than that. I, I had like the family portrait that we saw a picture of. Uh, that's four feet by six feet. That was a little more than I wanted to take on. And uh, several artists I've, I've um, uh, have relationships with or uh, or met and or you know worked with, and had told me about John Ansley, uh, who was a professional. Um, uh, you know, makes stretch canvases for uh, so famous artists canvases. as well as, oh. you know, and, and he's up in the Sonoma area. And so I gave him a call for this, this canvas. I go, well, I've got to do this professionally. And it's like a piece of furniture. They're just yeah, beautiful. They're the backs have, nice. are, uh, uh, you know, reinforced wood and, and uh, will turn buckles for tightening the canvas and he wraps it right around the edges completely. Just beautiful things. Right. So when he delivered this canvas for me for this family portrait, um, I gave him my portrait brochure and I said, "Well, this is the sort of thing I'll be calling you to have to do stretches for me because I, I'm not comfortable making them that, that large." And he goes, "Oh," he says, "I'm just on my way over to the Silicon Valley Luminary Society. They've lost their portrait painter, wow. the first one, and he's, he wanted me to come with some recommendations for him." And uh, I said, wow, it sounds like a really exciting project doing historic uh, uh, Silicon Valley inventors. And so I gave him my brochure, and, and he, um, he took it along with his other recommendations to the, to, um, um, the Luminary Society. And uh, the gentleman called me that afternoon. And, oh, uh, excellent. I, I saw him the next day, and, and uh, we got along well. And, uh, it was close by in Atherton, and uh, that That's was four great. years ago. <laughs> four, four years, years and six, six paintings ago. Four years, six paintings. <laughs> Excellent. Well, that's a perfect use of marketing materials, if I ever heard it. Wow. It's a great turnaround. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, it's short-run printing. It's uh, amazing. Yes, I agree. <laughs> so we went into your studio to videotape some of the paintings that you were working on and to, you wanted to show us some of the processes, different layers and different parts of the paintings that you're working on. So let's take a look at that video now. Yeah. Hi, I'm Terry Geyer. I'm a oil painter and a portrait painter. I do landscapes and figure paintings as well as portraits. and. Uh, I'm now doing a uh, series of portraits for the Silicon Valley Luminary Society. You know, like the one behind me, uh, these are post-World War II inventors. Then there's the physicist painting. Uh, other ones w tend to be of the same um, industry. We have the semiconductor inventors. We've got the computer inventors. Okay, those first four paintings are completed. And uh, I have the last two here, medical devices and biotechnology, which are, are still being worked on. In, and uh, we're working on in this segment. All right, I'm just making a, some kind of a tone to, to block in the lab coat. What I've done is shot pictures of myself in a lab coat just quickly in order to get the, how the lab coat folds. And I'm guiding also by pictures of Mir Imran when he was here in the studio. But it's all contrast, you know, if you've got a and it's beautiful gray tones. I mean, um, the subtleties in, in, in grays, warm and cool, uh, bounced off each other. It's just, 
more, more amazing than any bright colors you can, you can come up with. And again, I'm not really worried about getting everything just right. It's, uh, these are under layers, and this will give me something to work up on. A light falls off as it goes down, so I, uh, gonna make it a little darker down here. Now, I don't want to make the edge too rigid because, uh, that may not be the edge. Uh, and it's hard to, hard to knock that stuff back after. This stuff really makes a good, a good base. Now, I'm gonna quickly sketch in some, some pants. Just using that, some of that blue that I used up above, and mixing in some brown. So having a darker tone, I can go over the top of it with a, the warm or the cool or whatever and, and get another dimension. Now I'm just going to give myself an indication of the rather light side of the pants. You know, the next stage is I'll come in and go, okay, well, I got a lap coat on. I'm all right, good. I'm, so I'm, I'm there. You know, I'm, I need to make it look like the fabric that it is. Make sure that his anatomy is proper underneath. It looks like he's wearing it. The clothes are a, a secondary element, I think. They have to be rendered to an extent that they have to look like clothes, they have to feel like clothes. But it's a guy wearing the clothes or a woman wearing the clothes, and it's their clothes, and it has a life to it just like the life of the person. Now you have a complete painting in tones of gray. From that tones of gray, you add translucent color over the top of it in order to build up uh, a full color. Dr. Carl Gerasi was the inventor of the birth control pill in conjunction with Dr. Zaffaroni. This is dry, so it, it will come back, it would come back to this. And even if I just scrubbed a bunch of color on this and then wiped it off, the little bit of that trace color would be on here and already look better. So I like to work on a slipperier surface, so I will, will cover the, the paint with, I used to just cover it with some linseed oil. As I'm bringing up layers, I want to see a little more color put in because I kind of lose the color as I'm creating the tone. Now I've got a, a uniform color covering it. Uh, I can still see my previous work through it. And now I start adding paint on top of it. And I like to mix the paint right on the surface. Sometimes I work dark to light, sometimes I work light to dark. The photos that I have to work from are black and white. So I'm I had to kind of invent the color. I had to kind of remember what colors I saw when I painted from life with people. is isn't really covering up totally. It's leaving some of the under color. It still has an influence, and that influence is enough to, to start giving a translucency to the skin. Again, my favorite black. There's some red in it. That's red. We see tone more than we see color. And when you add the colored layers on top of it, you get those kind of pearlescent tones. Because it's, it's translucent, it shows the gray through it, you get those translucent tones that are so beautiful in the museum. Now I will put other colors onto it. Instead of mixing maybe an orange, I will put in a yellow, and then I'll bring in some red on top of it. You know, and then I can push that back and forth. And then I can come back with some white and lighten it, or I can come back with a dark and darken it. At this stage, I'm not worrying about final color because I will do that later. If you really know what you're going to paint before you're going to paint it, why, you know, what, what's the whole thing about, you know? I try doing little tight drawings and then uh, finish them, but by the time I get done with a tight drawing, I'm bored. You know, I don't want to paint it. I just did a drawing of it, you know? It's, so I, I need to leave a lot to happen when I'm painting it, you know? I, I want that next day for it to get better. If it gets better, the next day I'll come in and I'm more excited about doing it again. Well, thank you, Terry, for that tour of your studio and your painting techniques. That was great. Oh, thanks, yeah. So, nice. I'm curious, how many layers are there for each of the faces and the portraits that you do? I tend to um, paint over the faces probably at least four times, sometimes six. Wow. If it's bad, eight. You know, if, if I <laughs> still keep seeing things, I, I maybe do it eight times. Every time I paint it, I get more and more familiar with everything. I find uh, little turns of form that, that uh, are not quite where they should be or where I think they should be. And, and 
I make color changes and you know I, and, and at some point like yesterday I worked on Carl Jurassic's face again and that's probably the last layer because it, that just it popped now it was now now he's got that look um, it looks like him it and it's like got the, f the flesh tones and uh, the subtle expression and uh, now the other other uh, faces need to be need another layer so in between <laughs> each layer do you let it dry yes I let it dry as you can see in the in the video um, when I go and lay color over the whole thing and apparently obliterate it that surprised the, me <laughs> yeah the, those I can still see those things through it and so those are my guideposts, and because I have to redo the whole thing, that that um, making those those changes like um, uh, an, an eyelid that maybe is raising, you know, a sixteenth of an inch too far to the left is now going to be fixed when I'm going over it. I'm, I'm double checking everything again, and and I'm thinking of the form as well as, you know, you can't just look at a photograph and copy a photograph. No. The photograph just happens to be the reference you're using. You're thinking about the three-dimensional person and all the forms that you're painting to. So there'll be changes that need to be made in order to just bring a little more life. And, and uh, I'm working a lot with black and white photographs. And right. So the color is all invented. So uh, I will have better ideas of color and subtle color changes on top of the color that's already there add like just this make this really interesting flesh tones and uh, right with the translucency too so you can see yeah. under layers and yeah, it's very nice yeah I'll take a color and I'll start working it from the direction that that light that light that color of light I think is coming and then I will will lay it on heavier or lighter and I'm actually mixing the paint on the canvas uh, which is not normal normally way a lot of painters these days work They'll mix a color and just stick it in and opaque, but uh, that's not how I work. This is a lot more fun. So you brought <laughs> some you brought some JPEGs in to talk about a challenge that you faced in creating one of the paintings and how you had to deal with a client and different people's ideas to create this luminary society painting. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, we. Um, this is the medical device uh, portrait. How I start that will be I'll, I'll, the reference photos I have of the the painters, uh, uh, not the painters, the inventors. It's supposed to be shown at the uh, age they were when they made uh, their inventions. So I'm using old photographs of them, and I do a, a quick uh, rough of each of each of their faces, and that's how I, I start with uh, the drawing. Then I used mannequins, 12-inch uh, mannequins, and and created foam core walls and, and furniture uh, to scale so that I can then photograph this from different angles until I find something that I like, move the furniture around, move the people around. And uh, then from that I will adjust uh, the heights depending on the true heights of the people instead of them being six feet tall or whatever, five, seven or whatever, and uh, make those adjustments and, and render furniture out. And this is about as complex as I do the drawing. Um, I do a, most of my work when I'm painting, and uh, I, I don't want to do a really finished drawing. Okay, here I am. I'm happily, uh, uh, I, I put a grid onto the canvas, three inch squares, and I'm redrawing the entire uh, painting in, in umber uh, oil color, which is a, a brown pigment, translucent brown pig, pigment, which uh, allows me to render the whole thing. So that, here it is, it's all rendered out again. And uh, uh, I bring the client in to take a look at it, and he goes, oh, no, no, it's all wrong. I, the inventors all have to be in uh, chronological order from which one inventor. I don't want anybody sitting down. They all should be all standing. They all have the same. So you had to redo this entire sketch? I redid the, the entire the sketch. Oh, so no. this is a new, whole new sketch, a whole new setup. I also found out that the equipment was different. Uh, so here's, a, here's what I've done. I've, I've re-rendered the drawing again on top of the canvas, on top of the other old, old drawing. And now I'm trying to block out, block in the new uh, 
the new lo look of the canvas over the old one, and so I can, can see what I'm doing. Now, now here is starting to get more clear. And this uh, looks like right where you were showing us the painting. Yeah, that's right? about the time we, we, we filmed it. And here's a, a, a much further advancement of it. And things are still changing as I'm going through. I'm having cons being consulted of consulting about what the equipment actually looks like and does and what you can do and what you can't. And here's the, this is the finished painting. So where did you find the equipment for that? Um, we, uh, Tom Fogarty said he would make one of the devices for us uh, the same way he made it initially, which was uh, out of um, surgical gloves and, and uh, fly tying oh, no. spray. <laughs> and it was actually how it was invented. Uh, but he, he, never, he never could get to it, but they found photographs of, close-up photographs of what it looked like. Did you actually go to a hospital? Yes, yeah, so we went to um, uh, the El Camino Hospital before they built the new one so that we could see an old, oh. old uh, uh, um, uh, cath lab and what it looked like. So you did a lot of historical research yeah. and Dr. Dr. Per Perkins got us into the Camino uh, Hospital. That's where he, he worked a lot, and, and we were able to get a lot of help on that. Well, it's fascinating. I hope to see this in a display sometime soon. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for being on Talk Art with us, Terry. Your portraits are so exact and detailed. They're really beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, and I wish you luck with your future paintings of portraits and animals and landscapes all put together. Great. Thank you. Great. And thank you for watching Talk Art. I'm Sally Rain, your host. <laughs>